Hello, and welcome to Yoga Hype and History. Today, we're going to be looking at two very important modern postural yoga gurus named Patabi Joyce and BKS Iyengar. Both of them were students and disciples of Krishnamacharya. And for my money, these two figures are the most important figures in the spread of yoga and modern postural yoga around the world. And unlike Krishnamacharya, the majority of their students were Westerners and international folk. Okay, so let's get started. Come on. So uh, I've argued that the true roots of modern postural yoga are not the yoga sutras or any other prior Sanskrit sources. Modern postural yoga is not a persistent strand of asceticism going back in time, revelation of the sages, the activities of hatha yogis, but in fact, Modern pastoral yoga is really rooted in the Mysore yoga tradition that was started and framed by Krishnamacharya. That is the root which, that is the root from which the tree of modern pastoral yoga grows into a wide variety of branches. So remember my argument that yoga is not a single practice or a tradition or a lineage, but an ongoing experiment in perfecting the mind and or the body for the purpose of bodily perfection and magic powers and liberation, possibly. The meaning of bodily perfection, in fact, shifts from physical immortality and a strong body to support meditation, as it was amongst the Hatha yogis, to a balanced body characterized by health, flexibility, suppleness, and strength. While modern postural yoga was consciously set up to be universal and not connected to any one religion, the practices of modern postural yoga are couched in all sorts of Western and Eastern religious influences. The two most important disciples of Krishnamacharya are Patabi Joyce, who pushed forward and popularized the Mysore yoga tradition, shaping that tradition called Ashtanga Vinyasa, and BKS Iyengar, who situated himself in Pune, not Mysore, uh, and he taught Iyengar yoga, which he places in a line of transmission from Krishnamacharya. Both of these two gurus posited yoga for health and some light Sanskritic culture, and, and so they, they actually they would put Sanskritic names onto things. So they would imbue their yoga practice with some Indic Sanskritic culture, and both taught primarily to Westerners. Both of these characters have organizations that train and certify teachers, and they have plenty of yoga studios in the West. Namely, you have a younger yoga or what's just called Ashtanga yoga, which would be Ashtanga Vinyasa yoga. But if you look it up in like a phone book, it would be called Ashtanga yoga. <clears throat> so when you think about our three models of yoga teaching, here I have, uh, uh, I have Padabi Joyce in the middle, a young Krishnamacharya at the bottom, and at the top we see BKS Iyengar. When you think about them, they demonstrate a physicality and a masculinity that's very different from the colonial stereotype, which models uh, the, the male body as being weak, uh, effeminate, you know, or even degenerate. So the Indian male body as being lesser. The strength and flexibility and physical persona of these guys created, <clears throat> created a new model of the Indian and of the Indian male. I would argue that these ideals are still operative. And because of their physical presence, it's why you see so many photographs of them exercising and practicing at these studios and just in general. I mean, that said, these ideals of the masculine body in India, according to these yoga teachers, are also, like we see in the West, increasingly bulky and large as opposed to supple. By which I mean, the Indian male ideal is now sort of like the Indian or sort of like the Western male ideal. To put it in the phrase of action films, if you will, you go from a Chuck Norris to an Arnold Schwarzenegger. You go from a David Carradine to a Dwayne The Rock Johnson. So uh, the first person I want to look at is Patabi Joyce. Now you'll notice right here that he's adjusting this person, when I this woman. And when I say adjusting, I mean they put weight or they put their bodies onto other people's bodies to get them into a proper ideal position. And if you look all around him, you'll see that other uh, practitioners are being taught how to do adjustments on other human bodies. Okay, so what are some general characteristics of Ashtanga Yoga? Well, Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga is incredibly acrobatic and aerobic, and it's a set of sequences that are timed with breaths. 
And as such, it's kind of impressive to look at. I should have put up a picture of people doing some crazy Ashtanga yoga stuff. <clears throat> the name Ashtanga yoga, remember what Ashtanga is? Eight limbs. Ashtanga is usually said to be derived from the eight limbs of the Yoga Sutra, the eight limbs of yoga in the Yoga Sutra. But Singleton, and I think convincingly, has argued that there is an Ashtanga pose in this form of yoga that they do where all eight limbs of the body touch the ground. You're like, wait, I have four limbs of the body. Well, here, it's your two feet, your two knees, your two hands, your chest, and your head. So it's eight points of contact with the body. I don't know. There's something to that. Um, because after all, it's eight, it's the if it's the eight limbs of yoga and they only ever do asana and pranayama, how is it eight? You know, what are you going to do? One unique quality of Ashtanga yoga is that it does not just teach a type of yoga and certification to teach that yoga, but it requires teachers to regularly go to study with their lineage holder in India. The lineage holder these days is uh, R. Sharnath Joyce, who is the grandson of Patabi Joyce. And they have their yoga institute is located in Mysore, India, in South India. Joyce insisted, in fact, that his students not learn with any other teachers, which would interfere with their progress. It would slow them down. He also said he didn't want them to learn from books or photos. This is, in, this is interesting because, as we'll see with BKS Younger, he created the definitive book of photography of someone doing yoga perfectly. So the sense of the authority comes from the tradition and all people who practice, who teach Ashtanga yoga, they all regularly return to India. Arguably every 18 months, they're supposed to spend two months in India, in Mysore studying with the lineage holder. So it's, it's a rigorous program that has the sense of parampara, lineage or parampara, this goes after that. So the, the progression of gurus throughout time. To really do Ashtanga yoga and be a teacher, you must commit to going to India regularly to practice with a lineage holder, similar to, to a degree with the traditional guru-disciple uh, relationship. What am I saying this? Okay, to really be an Ashtanga yoga teacher, you got to commit to going to India. You got to commit to being in a somewhat traditional guru-disciple relationship. This is contrasted with a lot of other modern postural yoga that can just be done by any person and can be taught by any person who has been certified. And usually the certification when you're certified to teach to be a yoga teacher is kind of a one-time thing. You do a whole bunch of workshops and put in X many hours of training and whatnot, and then you're certified to teach. With uh, Ashtanga yoga, once they, once they grant you and it's the lineage holder, just you're practicing with them and he goes, okay, you're ready to start teaching. Then you, you still got to come back every 18 months, you got to spend two months in India, which is a little tricky. Um, my friends that are Ashtanga yogis, don't always make it for a full two months for a uh, every 18 months, but they get back often, usually once a year. And uh, I've known many people who are Ashtanga yoga people that uh, will relo have often relocated to India for years at a time. Okay, so <clears throat> this is somewhat similar to kind of in Hatha yoga where there would be like one guru and he'd have like five really good disciples and they would regularly be interacting with him, except well, I mean, Joyce and now uh, Sharat's Joyce has thousands and thousands and thousands. Okay, so let's contrast this for a second with Desi Kachar, who is uh, Krishna Macharya's grandson, who has a yoga certification program based on fulfilling a curriculum based on that is also based on Krishna Macharya's method and working with a mentor within the tradition. But it's just it's not rigorous like having a lineage holder here. Now, Iyengar, who we'll get to in a minute, has a structured curriculum in which someone can learn from a local teacher, but they do not need to learn directly from the lineage holder, i.e. Iyengar them himself, which would be difficult because he died in 2014. So the vinyasa style is explicitly connected to Krishnamacharya as derived from the text called the Yoga Karunta, which I'm dubious about, and the supposed Tibet living guru Ram Moham Brahmachari. In this sense, the yoga that is conceived here in um, Ashtanga Vinyasa is thought to stretch concretely back through a lineage, back into time immemorial from Ramohan Mahari's uh, guru to his guru to his guru to his guru. Okay. <clears throat> Joyce, in fact, added the sun salutation to structure the sequences. Originally, Krishnamacharya had sequences to some degree, but he didn't have them in a specific structure. And that structure is the 
um, is the Surya Namaskara, which you can see at the top in this picture here. And you can see the, 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 things, the things that they do getting more and more complicated until you have all these wacky inverted and crazy positions toward the bottom of this chart. All right. So the yoga method here involves, <clears throat> involves doing a sequence of positions based on the, the Surya Namaskara, the salute to the sun, the sun salutations, that are all accompanied by extra poses gaze point. So as you're doing poses, you're supposed to look in a specific direction, which will align your spine and your body in a different way because the body follows the eyes, of course. Um, and also locks, which are like holding your tongue here and here and kind of breathing in a special way or focusing and sucking up, sucking in your diaphragm. That's another lock that will restrain the breath and supposedly raise uh, prana energy and whatnot. So there's a standard initial sequence but then they have this elaborate ending sequence with backbending and inverted positions. So they have an initial sequence that is the sun salutation, but with more complicated stuff. And then it gets progressively more intricate until the end where they do these really intense, like, you know, standing on their heads and, um, and, and, and bending themselves into extreme contortions. Okay, so when it's practiced in a class, the students just do their sequence and the teacher will come by and adjust them, getting them getting them absolutely perfect. And in time, the teacher will watch the students do their do their yoga routine and he'll give them more and more positions as the body or as the student advances through these sequences. All this is known as yoga chikitsa, which means yoga therapy. Uh, chikitsa is a, is a word that could be medicine or therapy in Sanskrit. So performing independently with the teacher circulating is called the Mysore style. And this ideal must by implication require a return to India because you need to have these types of classes with the main guru adjusting you and examine you. Now in yoga studios, however, sometimes we can see no, more traditionally what we would think of as a modern postural yoga class in which the teacher demonstrates the positions and leads the class. I mean, that's how I always did yoga was with the teacher leading the class and demonstrating what was going on. All right. So what about the history of Mr. Patabi Joyce? He lived from 1915 to 2009, a ripe old life. He was born a Brahmin in 1915, and he witnessed a traveling yoga exposition by Krishnamacharya in 1927. You'll remember in the late 20s and early 30s, well, actually throughout the 30s, uh, Chris, the, Chris, the, Wode, the Maharaja of Wodeyar sent, uh, he sent Krishnamacharya, he sent Krishnamacharya out to like go to all sorts of these different places, went all over India, spreading, demonstrating and spreading this yoga style that he had created. So he saw, uh, Patabi Joyce saw Krishnamacharya when he was 12 and, and studied with him a little bit, but eventually at the age of 18, he went to Mysore to study explicitly with Krishnamacharya. And Krishnamacharya quickly had him doing demonstrations and teaching courses, like within less than a year. Krishnamacharya taught Joyce what he called to be the Yoga Karunta method, though, of course, Joyce never saw this text, the Yoga Karunta. Big surprise because it didn't actually exist. So like Krishnamacharya, Joyce's career had shaped, was really shaped by that Maharaja of Wodeyar. In fact, one of the things that I didn't get to before was that the Maharaja of Wodeyar was so taken with Krishnamacharya because supposedly Krishnamacharya magically healed him at one point of a serious illness. And it's funny, actually, as I think about it, when I talk about, when I talk to people I know that have been like doing yoga for 20 years, they often talk about being very, very sick and unhealthy. And they started doing, and they started doing yoga and they felt better. So they kept doing yoga and they've continued to feel better. So that sense is, does the yoga heal you? Was, or maybe, uh, maybe uh, Krishnamacharya had magical powers to heal people. They kind of said he did at one point. Anyway, so... Eventually, after the Maharaja of Wodeyar saw one of Joyce's yoga demonstrations, he offered him a position at the Sanskrit college at, at in Mysore University. Now, he didn't really go there and teach Sanskrit. He kind of was just associated with that university. So in Mysore, he established the Ashtanga Yoga Research Institute and in 1964 started teaching Westerners from his own home. Now, he expanded to build a big sit, big facility outside of Mysore in a place called Gokulam, which means something like a family of cows. And I just call it Yogaville. It is bougie AF, as the kids say today. I remember being out there once 
And I looked and I saw two people walk down the street and I was with, my, with a friend of mine and she said, do you have any idea how much that yoga outfit costs? And I'm like, no, why would I? And she told me, I gasped. And I'm like, that's more than the majority of Indians make in a month. So it has some weird bougie qualities to it that I find a little creepy. Anyway, Joyce first came to the West in, 19, in the 1970s and he went to California. In fact, he went to Encinitas, California. So he continued to make regular trips to the USA throughout his life and was seeing Ashtanga yoga really start to spread in the US. After his death in 2009, his grandson was appointed the lineage of head, was appointed the head of the lineage, which had been Joyce's will. That's what he wanted. He wanted his grandson to be the head of it. Now, the tradition goes strong. Usually when a guru dies, there's a lot of tumult around who the successor will be and a lot of fighting, but there wasn't in this case, which is actually really surprising in India. So it's going strong. And Sarat Joyce is currently the lineage heads. Now, there are offshoots of this system. If you've been thinking about yoga and looking at the types of modern yoga around, you've probably heard of power yoga. Well, power yoga is all derived from Ashtanga yoga. All right, on to Mr. BKS Ayengar in his Nataraja pose. This is on the cover of Light of Yoga. It's probably the most famous picture of Ayengar right here. Okay, Mr. Beat, Kick, and Slap. All right, general characteristics of a younger yoga. So, oh, one thing I wanted to note is we've got something different in the, the two chapters we read today. The first one written by uh, Byrne is by a devotee of Ashtanga yoga. He is an Ashtanga yoga guy. And the second one is by Smith and White. Smith is a very famous scholar uh, of Sanskrit Vedic culture. He wrote a fantastic book called, uh, what was it called again? I got it around here somewhere. Um, he wrote a great book, uh, yeah, called The Self-Possessed, about the history uh, and ethnography of possession and spirit possession in throughout India and throughout the history of India. Anyway, so Smith's a kind of a big deal scholar and White is a devotee. However, I know that Frederick Smith uh, started studying with Iyengar in the 1980s. And it's practiced yoga most of his life since then. He started studying with him while he was doing field research in Pune on uh, Vedic ritual. But anyway, so we have sort of insiders and yoga practitioners and scholars all together. So arguably BKS Iyengar is the most popular figure, or at least recognizable figure in international yoga. His book, Light on Yoga, is a definitive classic. And it's a new form of yoga book. It's a how to do yoga, like a how to book on yoga that has tons of photographs. And those photos are of Iyengar performing these very complicated positions and explaining how you get your body into these positions and explaining the health benefits. Now he really stresses that medicine or medical perspective on yoga, but he was never trained in medicine or anatomy himself. It's sort of a tradition he really designed. When he says, this is good for your liver, I'm like, how do you know, dude? Uh, anyway. Smith and White argue that he really didn't see himself as a traditional yoga guru, but over time, people started calling him Guruji, and he got comfortable being called a guru. Um, and he got kind of really comfortable with the fact that he was the world's foremost yogi. And all the pictures of him and his personal charisma and all his publications with pictures really makes a big difference on that. The appeal of a younger is that he was a religious man, right? Like he was a Sri Vaishnava, a Sri Vaishnava. So he was a qualified non-dualist Vedantin, just like Krishnamacharya. So um, the other interesting thing is that he is related to Krishnamacharya by marriage. Krishnamacharya is his brother-in-law, but they are of the same Brahmin class. So that means that um, their families are, are quite intermingled. All right. And that's kind of how it works for Brahmins. All right, so the appeal is he was a religious man, but he did not teach any real religious context. He developed new poses all the time and gave them Sanskrit names based on Hindu mythology, but he didn't want anybody to become Hindus or to become Sri Vaishnavas for that matter. What he did offer to students was strength and flexibility, physical progress. The physical side of it is what made it appealing, but also the photographic documentation of his amazing yoga and his amazing body inspired great excitement and called people to him. So it's a pretty low buy-in. You don't have to have any any beliefs. You don't have to really, you know, you're, you're supposed to acknowledge that Patanjali was great and you acknowledge that Iyengar is your teacher, but that's it. There's no complicated 
philosophy out there. I would say that there's a lot of philosophy underneath what they're doing, but it's just a body thing. So you could get to the point where you could have, you know, a, an international athlete being like, I'm not going to become a Hindu, but I'm going to learn how to do this crazy backbend. Okay. One difference that we see, and you can see this in the picture of the of these uh, people that are moving their legs around with ropes. One difference from other yoga that we've looked at so far is that a younger uses props and supports like belts, straps, chairs, and pillows to aid his uh, yogic practice and his teaching of yogic practices. He started this when he was recuperating from his own back being dislocated from a scooter accident. He actually stated that he was inspired to use props by mythological stories and the like in which yogis would describe themselves hanging from trees and so forth. Um, so by doing this, yeah, by doing this also, when he says it's inspired by things that yogis have done in art and in literature of the past, he's once again uh, adding a layer of uh, religiosity that and Sanskritic culture that builds authority on what he does, all the while he's, you know, advocating for this yoga being universal to all people. Okay, so um, in his he has in his curriculum to become a yoga teacher or to become a great yogi, he has a whole uh, curriculum with various stages going from introductory one all the way to senior advanced second. And I haven't really looked into what's involved in each of these processes. But the important thing is he has a, a set curriculum that can be taught by people other than himself, as long as they are certified by the younger yoga as being in a younger yoga facility. And I mean, there's 10 of them around me here in Denver, including Boulder. Yeah. So he is, so uh, BKSE Younger is generally referred to as just Mr. Younger. Only late in his life would he accept the term Guruji. And when he was alive, I remember they would still make, I would read about him and people would say that he makes a big point of just being called Mr. And called Mr. Iyengar, not Guruji or what, or any honorific. He was born in Belur in Karnataka into a Brahmin family who were quite poor. Now, if you look at his name, B.K.S. Iyengar, uh, and this is how naming works amongst Tamilian Brahmins, Belur is the area where, where he was from. Krishnamacharya is, in fact, his sort of lineage name. You know that one from before. And, his la and, his, and the S stands for Sundara Raja which means, uh, which is his given name, which means something like shining beautiful light or shining beautiful king. Uh, anyway, so he went to Mysore in 1934 to study with his brother-in-law, who was none other than Krishnamacharya. Krishnamacharya called him down to work with him because he had really poor health. And in fact, Krishnamacharya even said, <coughs> because of this guy's illnesses and his weak body, I don't think he's gonna be very successful. But in fact, he was. Through yoga, he was able to resolve his respiratory disease, which he had claimed was tuberculosis. Now, Iyengar stayed in Mysore and he was quite successful there. He was given a teaching position quite quickly. Ar arguably, people down there, when they get, if they show a lot of promise, as Joyce and Iyengar did, they, got, they used to get moved into being a teacher pretty darn quickly, instead of the years and years and years it takes to become a yoga teacher within their tradition. Maybe there's something to the fact that these guys are all kind of related. You know, they have the bodies and the genetics that would make them able to do these very powerful yoga uh, traditions, these complicated yoga traditions. All right. So he's down in Mysore and, uh, and Iyengar actually argues that in the one and a half years he was there, Krishnavacharya really only spent about 15 days total teaching him. So Krishnavacharya early on had him perform as a demonstrator for Krishnamacharya's yoga classes. So he would have him be up front as an example, and then he would walk around, and then Krishnamacharya would walk around and do his thing. Now, in fact, Krishnamacharya sent Iyengar after a year and a half to Pune, north near Mumbai, to teach. And there he had very little money, and he had very little command of, of English, and he had no command of Marathi. He really only spoke uh, Tamil at the time, and, and Kannada, which they speak in Karnataka. So Pune, he describes as having a physical culture of wrestling, especially training with ropes and poles and not really having any yoga time. So weighted clubs, ropes that are suspended, moving people around with ropes, sort of the, the traditional Indian wrestling practices. Nowadays, Pune, the town, uh, due to Iyengar's presence there for so long, is a destination where people go to study yoga. 
Also in Pune, he started teaching private medical classes, though, again, he had no training in science, medicine, or anatomy. He just started teaching. So I would argue that he was sort of experimenting and making stuff up. He was innovating and he couched his authority in yoga. He did not couch his authority in being a doctor by any means. Also, he started to do an earnest study of Sanskrit at the time. And he later said after studying uh, Patanjali and Vyasa, so the Yoga Sutras and the Yoga Sutra Basha, the Yoga Sutra commentary by Vyasa, he said these guys were as much as gurus as Krishnamacharya was. In fact, in the early 20, 21st century, BKS a younger actually built a temple in India to Patanjali, where there had never really been one before. So he added this Sanskrit component of appealing to these texts was another way to bolster his authority. So while there was no unbroken tradition of gurus stretching back through times, there were venerated books, which those venerated books connect his innovations to the past. In time, he established a yoga organization. And when he wrote to Krishna, Krishnamacharya about difficulties with some students for advice, Krishnamacharya said, well, you better send him to Mysore. At that point, I don't know why he got to this understanding. He decided that, well, if Krishnamacharya is going to tell him that. I'm not sending him anybody. And I guess I'm an independent teacher now. He always uh, claimed that Krishnamacharya was his guru. However, uh, Patabi Joyce claimed that, in fact, he, Patabi Joyce, was Iyengar's guru, which uh, Iyengar said, no, that's not true. So he went to the United States in 1956, and he returned several times throughout the 70s. He had a number of prominent Western artists and movie stars whom he taught, especially the famous violinist uh, Yehudi Menuhin, who uh, ended up writing the preface of Light on Yoga. He was a big deal in his time. I think he also trained Annette Benning, but so you probably don't know who these people are. All right. So he gave his first teachings in the US and also performed impressive yoga demonstrations that were recorded and persist on YouTube today. And I'll put uh, an important one up on the, on the webpage for you. So Light on Yoga, his big book. Uh, yeah, so I had all this stuff. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, Light on Yoga, and there's, there's the traditional picture. And you can look at the impressive Iyengar stuff on the left and on the on both pictures on the left. So he wrote his book and had it published. Light on Yoga was published in 1966, and it has become the almost the Bible of modern postural yoga. Like I said before, it's the first how-to yoga book with incredible photographs, descriptions of the of the body positions and how to get into those body positions. And he makes medical therapeutic statements for each pose. Like this one's good for your liver. This one's good for your knee. This one's good for your uh, imbalance of bile. I don't know. Interestingly, at least to me, uh, Light on Yoga was in fact really shaped by a guy named Gerald York, who was a personal student of Aleister Crowley in Britain. He was instrumental in getting the book published. And as I hang around with some of the Crowley groups these days, I'm surprised at how popular modern physical yoga is amongst contemporary Crowley type practitioners. So uh, back to BKS Iyengar. He formed his main yoga center in 1975 and named it Ram Ramamani Iyengar Memorial Yoga Institute in Pune in honor of his late wife, Ramamani, who died in the 1970s. Later in his life, he started teaching um, pranayama but so this is kind of an important thing. In his early career, he didn't do anything with pranayama. He just did he just did asanas. He just did body postures. But later in his life, he started teaching pranayama, but he taught it separately as a separate practice, not to be done at the same time as the postures. And the question is, why is this? And some have argued, and I think this is correct, that Krishnamacharya wasn't doing pranayama at the time. And he did that much later in life as well. Okay. So he retired from teaching regularly in 1984, though he was still active at the Yoga Institute, teaching classes on occasion and whatnot. He died in 2014. He was a very old man. Um, he was nearly 100 years old. His work is spread through a younger stu yoga studios around the world. There are 10, there are 10 of these a younger yoga schools, either partially or solely dedicated to a younger yoga, just in the Denver area. I'm in Denver, that's what I think about. Uh, yeah, and we've got a quote here by him. When I practice, I'm a philosopher. When I teach, I'm a scientist. When I demonstrate, when he does his yoga demonstrations, I am an artist. I think that's fair to say. 
All right, so we have some great quotes by Smith here. Smith writes that the personal magnetism and natural abilities of Krishnamacharya aside, the reason for this popularity and success are the effective integration of physical fitness regimes, including gymnastics, also an attractive Western esotericism that helped yoga, helped domesticate yoga to a rising outward looking middle class, separating it from the domain and control of renunciate ascetics. So it's very much set for lay people. Also the influence of locally constituted wrestling traditions and the institutional support of the Mysore Jagan Mohan Palace, including Krishna Raja Wodeyar, the Maharaja himself. In conclusion, Smith writes, he has the he has a unique ability to weave in a single class the precise details of anatomy, the mechanics of movement, traditional narrative, and philosophy to allow him to stand out as perhaps the most paradigmatic yoga guru of the last 75 years. All right, criticisms. Well, in Ashtanga yoga certification, you have to do a lot of training. It requires you to go to India. So that requires you to be able to take off two months of work at a time or work remotely from India every 18 months. That's a lot. And it's, you got to travel there and you got to support yourself there. And it's living, it's, it's cheaper living over there than the U.S., but that's still expensive. Um, so also one of my concerns is that with both of these guys, Ashtanga Yoga and Iyengar, there is no study of anatomy or first aid, which is generally taught in yoga teacher certification programs outside of their traditions. Iyengar has a more set curriculum than Patabi Joyce's Ashtanga Yoga did, but it doesn't have any formal medical training. So the common joke among scholars and other gurus is that both schools claim to be Ashtanga, so to be eight limbs, but neither of them teach more than two of those limbs. Both gurus were known for being sweet, but they were also known for being very stern and also for wrenching bodies into extreme positions. They were really big on being precise and on physic and on physic and having teachers physically adjust people. So pushing your legs into the right position. And they were really kind of vigorous about it. And they were known for being very stern. I mean, that's why that's the joke is. BKSE Younger stands for beat, kick, and slap. Um, okay, the, one of the things that really bothers me is there's a high incidence of injury in these forms of yoga, with nearly every practitioner at some point in their career describing injuries coming usually from yoga adjustments in class that had effects that were over one month long. These injuries come from adjustments performed aggressively by yoga teachers. Now, the very act of putting your hands on someone in a yoga class is controversial, to the possibility not only of injury, but of as an opportunity for sexual violation by that guru. And you can see how that would happen. I mean, I've definitely been in yoga classes before where my teachers have come by and adjusted me. So it's like they get my shoulders just right, or they balance my arm, or they get my head pointed in the right direction. But these guys would come through and just like, you know, if your knee was up higher than it needed to be, or if they thought you could go further, they'd just step on your knee and push it into the right position. Uh, and it's described as being very painful, but it's also said to produce results. It produces injuries, but it also accelerates practices. None of these teachers were trained in anatomy or medicine. So how could they know if their health claims are real or if the positions could be dangerous? Their authority is based on tradition, charisma, and personal experimentation and practice. So it's a little, that's a little tricky. How do you know what they're saying is good? How do you know what they're saying is healthy? Especially if they hurt you, what do you think? So you have to have a deep trust for them and a commitment to them, something I don't think I could ever have. So while these are traditional gurus in a way, because you know they teach and whatnot, neither, none of them are renunciates. They were all married, they were all Hindus. So they're not like the renunciate gurus that you generally see in India who would be you know, lineage holding monks in a specific order. And then they would initiate their disciples into that order. <clears throat> One thing I find is it gets a little cultish when I'm hanging out with Ashtanga yoga people. And there are a lot of them in Santa Barbara uh, that I would spend time with. And they get cultish, not just because they revere a guru and a lineage, but they just really get cliquish and insular. They view their yoga as being sort of the best form of yoga and everybody else just kind of messing around. And they're just kind of like Ashtanga, the Ashtanga yogis especially are like Ashtanga yoga fundamentalists. All right, so finally, the big problem is Patabi Joyce was a sexual abuser. I mean, it's been well documented by disciples and students that he would adjust people 
uh, males and females, and he would push his body against them, people in a sexual way. There was enough documentation that the lineage itself and the current, the current head of the lineage, Sharat Joyce, has admitted what his grandfather did and has, has apologized and asked for forgiveness for it. So after a whole hugger mugger about this whole thing, <clears throat> it became clear that, yes, he did it. And so they've apologized. But, you know, he's still the guru. He's still that main guru that, you know, everybody in Ashtanga yoga looks up to. All right. So that was the story of Padabi Joyce and BKS Yenger, two modern 20th and 21st century powerhouses, creating modern postural yoga, diffusing it and spreading it, taking the model of Krishnamacharya and bring it to the world. All right. I'll catch you on the flip side. Take care.